So I would like to, to first to introduce our first speaker, who is Ambassador Barbara Bodine. Uh, Ambassador Bodine participated in our program in, in Hong Kong at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 1968. She has a, a bachelor's degree from, uh, in political science and Asian studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1970. And then she was presented in 1991 with the uh, UC Santa Barbara Alumni Association uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. In 2002, Ambassador Bodine was president of the UCSB Alumni Association and has served as an alumni reg regent on the California Board of Regents. So she's probably familiar with this building since often the regions gather here. Um, she earned a master's degree at the Fletcher School of Law and, Di and Diplomacy of Tufts University. Uh, she has a very distinguished career, 33 years in the Foreign Service, which was spent primarily in the Middle East, with a focus on security and counterterrorism. She served as U.S. Ambassador to Yemen from 1997 through 2001, and also in Kuwait and Iraq. In 1991, she received the Secretary of State's Award of, of Valor for her work in occupied Kuwait. After leaving the Foreign Service, Ambassador Bordine has been a fellow at Harvard University, at MIT, and a visiting professor at the University uh, of California, Santa Barbara. Since 2007, she's been a lecturer in public and international affairs and director of the Scholars in the Nation Service Initiative of the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University. She's also a member of the Board of Director of the American Academy of Diplomacy. And in July 2014, she was appointed to her current position as Director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy and Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Bodai. everybody and thank you for spending part of your weekend here in this beautiful building. Um, after that long bio you can well imagine why I have to put these things on. Um, and I should start off by saying that there's a couple of my classmates here tonight. Uh, so you know hi guys. Uh, and this is my version of what happened in Hong Kong so um, <laughs> take it at that. Um, I want to start off by saying Charles King, who is a professor at Georgetown, uh, in a recent foreign, part, foreign policy article on the decline in international studies, uh, which he subtitled, Why Flying Blind is Dangerous, notes that US power and influence in the world is, is much more than our economic and our military advantages. Um, but in his view, it actually reflects um, our unmatched, what he calls our unmatched knowledge of the hidden, interior, we, the hidden interior of other nations, which he describes as language and culture, histories and political systems, economies and human geographies. And he credits Title VII for creating this community of those who possess all of those skills that hidden knowledge and the sheer intellectual curiosity to peer deeply into foreign societies. UC Education's abroad program comes out of that same Cold War era, uh, that same need to know, and fueled that push uh, in I think many of us for that hidden knowledge driven by our sheer curiosity in the world outside. The Education Abroad program, for all of us, certainly for me, provided an unmatched opportunity for students, for Californians, no less, to explore and to understand the world at a level and at a depth, and in a way that had been largely uh, confined to either the moneyed elites um, or to the missionary generations. 
maybe not even to the soldiers or the tourists. It helped us develop from personal experience, not just from books, an appreciation for people and practices and ideas that were not our own. It is hard to imagine that the Higher Education Act, which provided funding for regional studies and language studies, was passed only in 1965, as the same year that this education abroad began, and only four years within the establishment of the Fulbright program. We are so globalized now, we are so internationalized and connected and transnational that it's hard to imagine that these changes in our approach to education and to the rest of the world is that recent. And also to really fully appreciate how perishable this phenomena ha is. That those who went abroad not in search of monsters to destroy, as to borrow a phrase from President Adams, but those who went abroad to know the world as it really is, not as we wished it to be, but that we were willing to meet the world on its own terms, to talk not at the world, but with, but with the world, and not from within the confines and the presumed safety of our own little bubbles. When I went to Hong Kong a very long time ago, as a student reminded me before he was even born, <laughs> ah, thank you so much for that. Uh, when I went to Hong Kong so very long ago, we did not live separately. We did not learn separately. We did not travel or even watch TV separately from our Chinese classmates. I lived in a dorm room in Kowloon with three Chinese roommates on the lower half of a bunk bed that was designed for people considerably shorter than I was. My feet didn't go to bed for a year. I took the local bus and the train out to the new territories daily. I remember very distinctly taking a class on Western philosophy from a Chinese professor with Chinese students who questioned all of my internalized assumptions on philosophy. It was not philosophy as we saw it and understood it ourselves, but as we were seen and understood by others. Not just how do others see their own world, but how did they see us? One day, I passed a large shop window down in Hong Kong, and I was frankly surprised to see a Westerner look back at me. I was looking at me, looking back at me. A couple of years ago, I gave a commencement address at a very small college in California, and it was entitled, Go Out and Get Dirty. The parents in the audience were not at all amused. Um, this was not an address, by the way, on personal hygiene, nor was it an address on water conservation. But it was a challenge to these students to go out and experience well beyond their comfort zone and their conventional expectations. I called on them not to visit the world, but to live in it to become engaged and to participate in it, not as a separate entity, but as part of it. Because, and this is where I would go well beyond Charles King's call for an international studies as a critical need in a domestic society, because still, and being still as observers and scholars, his view, is still as scholars and observers a bit removed from the world. But far more important to me are the opportunities like education abroad. They let us learn about ourselves, who we are when no one, when our parents, their, our school, our community, and our friends, to learn about who we are, what are our values, what are our priorities, what is our character, what is our resilience? And that, I think, is a major thing to learn. How is it that we are really grounded? The kid from the wrong side of the west end of the San Fernando Valley, an actual valley girl, turned Santa Barbara sorority sister, 
That kind of kid, by the way, never came back from Hong Kong. Thank goodness. The world to me became much larger, far more interesting, complex, and nuanced. It is a place I, found, I have found endlessly fascinating, often frustrating, and occasionally frightening, but I have never ever found it boring. The world is not some place that I visit. I live there. Its people may be baffling to me, but they are never foreign to me anymore. They are never the other. I sincerely and fervently hope that this program, and I was pleased to hear how well it is doing, that this program and all of its sisters pro sister programs live long and prosper. The complacency that we are somehow sufficiently connected and globalized, that we Americans are sufficiently dominant even if it is in the, some short-sighted ways like our military, and that we no longer need to go abroad and get dirty. If this becomes the way we view the world, we will wither. We may not die, but we will wither. We will lose the vibrancy that comes from sheer curiosity, and from, uh, we will lose the vibrancy that comes from cultural humility, and we will lose our ability to relish everything that is different. I was asked to talk about how education abroad in Hong Kong changed my life. I really don't know. Uh, my year in Hong Kong was not an event. It was not something separate in my life. I cannot imagine my life um, other than the one that I have lived. But it was, it did create a profound and wonderful change on how I see the world how I understand who I am. It did not create my commitment to become a diplomat. I brought that with me to Santa Barbara. And in fact, it is why I chose Santa Barbara. And it is also why I was also hellbound to go to Hong Kong, um, despite some naysayers who said I would never make it. Just shows them. Um, but what Hong Kong and education abroad did was it affir affirmed my goal that the foreign service and diplomacy and a life abroad was the right choice for me. It did help me get into graduate school and it did help me get into the foreign service when women and Californians, much less a valley girl, were very unwelcome realities in both of those worlds. More importantly, it gave me the confidence and the grounding to do that to believe, to actually assume that despite the conventional wisdoms and the empirical evidence that I could go to graduate school, I could become a diplomat, and that I could succeed. I do wonder sometimes, and certainly on an evening like tonight, if those who established this program and those who allowed me to go and those who, I will say, as a first in family to go to college, made it financially possible for me to go. I wonder if they have any idea what they were setting in motion when they let me into education abroad and how far the ripples would continue to go. But I will say that if any of them were here tonight, I would say thank you very much. <laughs>